Welcome to Lancefield on the Line. My name is David Lancefield, and I couldn't be happier to welcome Dory Clark. Welcome, Dory. Hey, David. And you are the author of a brand new book called The Long Game, How to Be a Long-Term Thinker in a Short-Term World, due out in September or October 2021, depending on where you are in the world. And that is the fourth book from your stable of books, Reinventing You, Stand Out, and Entrepreneurial You, and I've read them all. You're a coach to entrepreneur, entrepreneurs and executives, a keynote speaker, a teacher, whether on LinkedIn or in the classroom in Duke, uh, Columbia, and many other business schools. Uh, and you are a Broadway investor, a cat lover, and a table tennis player, and a very proud New York resident. Um, you have rightly received loads of recognition uh, from Marshall Goldsmith's award, being the number one communication coach in the world, and our friends at Thinkers 50, um, being one of the top thinkers in the world, which is fantastic. And you write beautifully and brilliantly in HBR, Fast Company, and various other places. And clearly you are an expert in reinvention, communication, and many other things. Uh, you have a brilliant mind, a fast mind, an entrepreneurial spirit, and a sense of generosity, which I particularly appreciate. Um, we've worked together on four articles for HBR already, and I'm hoping we can do, whether it's that or some other things in the future. And I've learned a lot along the way. I'm really happy that you spared some time in your busy schedule to talk to with me today. You are too kind. I really appreciate it. Thank you. So let's get stuck in. Let's let's focus on the book. We're also going to focus on maybe a little about you as well and your own mindset and so on. So, hey, wherever you are in the world, there's a lot of uncertainty out there. Complexity is another word that's used and many of us feel it. So a lot of us get really quite tactical and short term. We focus on what's in front of us. Yet your book says that we should focus on the long game, even in these times. So tell me how and why we should do that. Absolutely. Well, of course, we, we always do need to, at the end of the day, focus on the tactical and actually get things done and execute. But the problem is that so often for many of us, that's all we do. That's all we ever do. Because the mm. tactical is what is urgent. It's what's screaming in front of our face. And I think all of us have probably felt the pressure when there's, you know, 150 uh, emails sitting in our inbox and you start to get, you know, the second and the third, uh, just bring this to the top of your <laughs> inbox. And you're like, oh, you know, you feel like the worst person in the world. But of yeah. course, objectively, we all understand that doesn't really matter that much. Like yeah. at the end of the yeah. day, are you going to feel proud that you processed 150 emails? I mean, that's nice. But, but guess what? By the time you wake up the next morning, it's back again. Yes, um, we yes. need to have a longer term perspective so that we actually are marching toward something rather yes. than just doing this endless stream of activities that don't necessarily net out to anything in the end. Yeah. I um, mean, you talk a lot about in your book and also your other work around in doing that, sort of trying to experiment, you know, with new things and new initiatives, take it, placing some bets. How do you, how do you keep yourself true? If you, if you are a sort of person who has a cause or a purpose and not all of us have that it tends to be more emergent but how do you how do you keep being wise to yourself while you're trying lots of different things yeah i think it's an, an important question you know when i when i work with my coaching clients actually one of the things that we often talk about is this kind of idea or this question of how do we trick ourselves or how do we outsmart ourselves? Mm -hmm. Because all of us, you know, every person has their ambitions, their goals, but they're not necessarily easy to accomplish. And so along the way, it would be nice, of course, if all we had to do is say, well, this is the course forward. And then we yeah. proceed in lockstep to, uh, to accomplish that. But there's ups, there's downs. Uh, people, people get frustrated along the way, or they worry that, uh, that it's not really working. And so maybe they want to stop or get off the path. Yeah. Sometimes we get distracted and, uh, and you need different forms of accountability. So Self-knowledge is a key piece of that. I mean, I have um, one frame that's interesting is Gretchen Rubin has uh, written this book. She talks about the four tendencies, and it's really about accountability mechanisms. You know, is, yes. it, is it enough for you to just say, oh, I'm going to do it, and then you do it? Or do you need to lock it in with an external partner, let's say? Yes, so yes. It's, it's thinking through, what do I need? Maybe, maybe it is 
you know, hiring the personal trainer so I don't disappoint them. Uh, you know, you'd, you'd think that it would be enough to say, oh, I'm going to lose weight. But no, it's it's that I, you know, if David's going to be there at 6 a.m., I don't want to be the dick that stands him up. And if that's what it takes, then great, let's do that. Yeah, unlikely to be me at 6 a.m. Although I do get up very early with my son, but doing other things. You know, the one thing along in the journeys, you know, the journeys that are not A to B that you sort of chart in your in your book is one thing I like about you, Doris, you, you're quite open about the things that haven't gone so well. And you do that sort of properly and you're highly successful and a great person. But, you know, there are other people like that who tend to just sort of give you tiny little examples that are not failures at all. But you've you've had to. And I appreciate that, you know, that spirit. But you you talk in the book about, you know, thinking in in waves right? Which I thought was a brilliant concept. Can you just tell me a little bit more about what that means in practice and how, how perhaps you've applied it yourself? Yeah, absolutely, David. So one of the things that I realized, and again, all, all of this is very much the product of me kind of <laughs> bumbling my way into it, but then codifying it later on as I, mm. as I realized retrospectively, oh, that worked. Why did that work? And uh, trying to, to understand it so that it hopefully I could create a framework that might make it easier for other people. But yeah. when I first started my business working for myself, I spent probably, you know, at least a year, probably two years in the vast majority of my time was spent just immersing myself in information, just kind of learning about yeah. the field. And I, I needed to, frankly. I mean, I I didn't know much about business. I had worked in journalism. I'd worked in politics. I'd studied theology. I, I knew about plenty of things, but not really the corporate world. So I, I would have been woefully underprepared if I had just marched in and said, oh, I know. I know what to do. Let me solve yeah. your problems. So I, I think sometimes there's a couple of issues that happen with people when their business is not going the way they want or they feel like it's stagnating at a certain point. One is that sometimes people tend to want to jump the gun and just yes. go faster than they should. If, if I had not taken that time to really learn what I was talking about and I immediately jumped into the next wave, which is about you know creating content, sharing your ideas, I probably would have looked like this underinformed blowhard, uh, which would not have served me well in the end. Yeah. So yeah. I think pacing yourself is important. But what's also important is that sometimes people get stuck at a certain level and they don't necessarily perceive themselves as being stuck. It's often because, well, I like doing this thing. You know, this feels comfortable. Um, some people do get stuck. I'd say in the learning phase, yes. uh, they get kind of addicted to, oh, I'm going to sign up for every course. Or some people get stuck at the connecting phase because maybe they're an extrovert and, oh, they just love meeting people. But ultimately, you have to do different things at different phases in your business in order to ensure it's successful. And that's that's mm -hmm. the hard part of entrepreneurship, frankly, is Oftentimes, if you're working in a corporation, you can get away with doing one thing and just rocking that thing and yeah. it's fine. Uh, when you're an entrepreneur, you really have to be uh, a utility infielder, which uh, I don't know if they actually use that phrase in cricket. So sorry <laughs> if they don't. That's I think a we baseball get it. term. I think we get it. Yeah. It means I, think I, was, I think I was the utility person. Yeah. In yeah. Many <laughs> I mean, it's interesting. You. I still think it actually applies to some corporate execs. So I know I, both in my previous shop and other places I know, you know, very senior execs doing a great job in the moment, but then a new boss, you know, is appointed. There's a restructuring. There's an there's a deal that happens, and suddenly it's like actually you you haven't caught up, uh, and it's often quite a rude awakening. You know, it's quite a shock if you've effectively been doing, and you know you have this big empire and all the paraphernalia that comes with it. Um, and it's quite a shock, but that, that comes onto the topic of, um, I guess, failure, because, you know, how many times have we read the thing, you know, fail, fail fast, learn. I mean, it's all beautiful, like in hindsight, but failure is pretty messy, right? And it can be pretty difficult and, and frankly, ugly at times. Um, how do you, as you're pursuing a long game, how do you deal with the, if you like the emotional ride, let alone all the other costs that come with it, financial and so on? How do you, how do you deal with it? Yeah, it, I mean, it's it's certainly not easy in the moment. That's that's for sure. I have been fascinated for a long time by some research by a, a gentleman that I know at the University of Chicago named David Galenson, and he is an economist, but he did a lot of work around 
art and the art market mm-hmm. and what he wrote about. And in fact, Malcolm Gladwell uh, later wrote uh, an essay in the New Yorker kind of drawing on his research. But what's interesting in the art world is there are, and it's true in the rest of life as well, um, there are some people who are just sort of anointed from a very early age. They're 20 years old, 22 years old. Everyone's, oh, they are genius, like Picasso, right? From the time he began, everybody said, oh, he's so special. He's so amazing. Meanwhile, there are other artists that don't get recognition until their 40s, 50s, sometimes even later. And what Galenson said, which I think, you know, really stayed with me, is the problem, it's not just that the outside world is looking at them and saying, "Ah, well, you know, what what have they made of themselves? Ah, You know, they're not that great. Mm -hmm. The problem is that the artist thinks that too, because they don't know. They really don't have any way of telling Am I, am I just not that good? Am I just not that successful? Or is it that I'm not successful yet? And in yes. that moment, before it happens, it is really, really hard to tell the difference. Yeah, I get that. One of the things I've admired about you, Dory, is that you're, you're good at sort of leaning into things early, having a go early, as opposed to sort of riding the wave afterwards. And there's benefits of both. But for example, you know, you talked about this, but you going into the online online learning if you like early uh, whereas now it's sort of receive wisdom that you if you can have a go develop your own go with linkedin or whatever you did that like, pretty early i mean whether in that example or more generally how do you lean into them how do you what do you use to sort of spot the signals and have a go at trying new things in that regard whether they whether you know you're, they're right for you or not. What do, what do you, what do you, what do you use? A- analysis, intuition, experience, networks? What do you use? Yeah, well, th- first of all, thank you, David. I appreciate it. I mean, it's, of course, in in the moment as you're doing it, it, uh, it actually always feels late, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, that's so, true. Yeah, I, yeah. I started doing uh, online courses in 2014. I'm like, oh, I've just like missed the boat. <laughs> it's so late. It's so late. And, you know, of course, time's going to pass. And sev- seven years later, um, you know, well, now suddenly that was that was on the early end of things. I think we probably can all feel the same way about like Bitcoin or, <laughs> or something. Yeah. My, my mother takes great pleasure in uh, reminding me that we took a trip uh, I took her with me on a speaking engagement in Hong Kong in 2014, and there was some kind of a something. I don't, I don't even know what kind of an entity it was, but literally they had hawkers out on the street who were giving people these like scratch cards uh, as a promotion. And it was like, oh, sign up and you can get a free Bitcoin. And it's the street was like was like littered, like the trash cans, you know, <laughs> because nobody wanted it. They're like, oh, what is this? And I didn't take it either. I'm like, oh, like oh. like too much hassle for this thing that's like, oh, it's like 40 cents or whatever it was. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm like, how am I even gonna like retrieve this? Where do you store it? Oh. You know, so I didn't care. And of course, now you know, you pick up a few of those, and uh, I'd, I'd be Elon Musk. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I think that the short answer is, um, and this ties into the question of failure, it's just how do you make a small enough bet that it just literally doesn't matter if you yeah. fail? That's yeah. the, the, you know Nobody cares that much if they lose 10 bucks. Lots of people care if you lose $100,000 or a million dollars. And so how do, you, how do you create a rapid series of $10 bets so that you know, like, oh, it, you failed? Did you fail, David, because you you ordered a chicken sandwich and you didn't like it? Like, no, you know what? Yeah. For dinner, you order something different. Who yeah. cares? Um, so ultimately, doing online courses was just something that I'm like, well, you know, I'll, tr- I'll try this. I'll try that. And I tried working with a couple of different providers of the mm-hmm. courses and some of them, I mean, honestly, haven't panned out very well. Like there's one now, which I, you know, nearly close to a decade later, I think I've made like ten, twelve thousand dollars from it. I mean, mm-hmm. that's nice. That's not nothing, yeah. but it's, you know, it's not what you're going to retire on over a decade. Um, but then there's, there's other experiments that I've had with online courses that have actually been, you know, exponentially more lucrative and it's just trying a lot of them. Yeah. Yeah, I get that. And one of the things you, I guess, along the way, you have to be patient. You use the term actively and vigorously patient in order to focus. I'm fascinated with that because 
yeah, I, um, and I, this is not just all about you, although I am interviewing you, so why not? But, you know, for somebody, for example, like you and, 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 and other great people, we have lots of ideas, lots of opportunities coming to you. You can do lots of things. You can probably think 10 times quicker than others, if not more. How do you do it? How do you be patient when you know you can do great things and there's, there's no shortage of, you know, stimuli and opportunities to go for? How do you do it? How do you stay patient? Yeah, I'm glad you raised it. Um, one of the sort of mantras in the book, which I actually thought about having this as the as the subtitle of the book, although I, I ultimately decided not to, and, and it's just a chapter heading, but it's strategic patience. Yes, yeah. and the the idea behind that really is there are a lot of people that are patient in what I would sort of describe as as a passive way, but which to me is, is essentially a form of wish fulfillment where yeah, it's just yeah. like, let's make the vision board and oh, maybe it'll happen. It'll happen somehow. Mm. And I mean, sometimes it does. That's, that's not wrong. Um, but also, is that really what you want to bet on is just like magic things will happen. Um, to me, that's a little discomforting. I, I would rather be proactive in this. And I would rather feel at the end of the day that I have placed a bet yes. and the bet might not work. Not all the bets do, but I feel like I will have done my part if I am actually making choices. Yeah. Um, there's a great book uh, that I love by Richard Rummelt called Good Strategy, Bad Strategy. Mm. And in it, what he, what he talks about is, you know, most amazing strategic decisions that get praised in the history books, they're actually not that like surprising. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a little bit like good strategy is kind of like, duh, like, of course they did that. Right. Yeah. But, the, but the part that makes it exceptional and, and the reason that it gets written about in history books is that even though it's, it's not a crazy thing that they made that choice, what is crazy, what is unique is the fact that they made a choice. Yes, yes. People are yeah. so unwilling to choose. And I think there's real power for all of us in saying, you know what? I accept the consequences of my decision. And here is what my decision is. Hmm. And that, and that, that theme and, and, and the other themes you, in your book, it, it's very empowering in a positive way. But this is about take, taking some personal responsibility and not letting stuff happen to you. But And it also doesn't mean betting your whole you know, everything on one thing, but it is about crafting your own, frankly, your own business, your own life, having a go rather than having incentive and entitlement, which often many people give off, right? Which is, I'm, I'm amazing. I've had this education. Surely this should all come, come to me. The other thing about failure I've noticed, also in my own head, as I made this transition over the last year, is um, what, you know, Failure for you, whether it's the chicken sandwich or other things, can feel very big at the time. Chicken sandwich wouldn't be that big for me. But, um, but firstly, not a lot of people are noticing, and they probably don't care enough about you anyway, but it's very much in your own head, right? A lot of the time it's in, in your own head. But let me just delve into a little bit more about you then. So when you're firing on all cylinders, lots of opportunities to go for, lots of offers coming, coming to you, how do you, um, how do you sustain yourself? Not just in terms of patience, but yourself, because you know it's it's different when you've got well, may or may not be different when you've got lots of people around you, lots of teams. When you're either a solopreneur and you have your own networks, how do you sustain yourself to make sure you don't get frankly burnt out or bored? Yeah, it's it's an it's an important question, and certainly since you've in the past uh, year gone out on your own, I'd be curious about your answer too, David. Um, but I will say a couple of things. The first is I, I really do believe in the importance of creating a community around you. Yes. Um, yeah. partly, partly because of sort of encouragement and emotional support, partly informationally, honestly, because yes. yeah. one of the biggest problems that I see when it comes to solo practitioners is there, there's often just um, a, a real power differential in terms of access to information. Because yes. for instance, if you're doing B2B work, corporations are hiring coaches or consultants all the time. Yes. They know what things go for. Yeah. They know how to structure things. And you know, we're just kind of making, making things up. And so if we want to level the playing field, we really need to create 
uh, a community of peers with whom you have a close and trusting enough relationship that you can actually have honest conversations about, well, what should I charge for this? Or how should yeah, I yeah, yeah, structure yeah. this? Which in many ways is, is the premise of my recognized expert course and yes. community that I've created over the past yeah, five great. years. Um, so that's, that's a piece of it is just a community of one's peers. And the other is actually it goes back to, uh, to the thinking in waves concept that you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. There are times when, you know, we're just incredibly busy and it becomes a problem. Of course, if you're always incredibly busy, if it, yes. you know, if it's just unrelenting, but what I typically like to do is at the beginning of a year, think about my year in quarters or, you know, in sort of half year increments and just say, all right, you know, obviously there's always going to be the kind of day-to-day -day machinations we have to do. We've got some meetings, we've got some email, yeah. we've got some client work, but what are the big strategic emphases over the quarter or over the, the half year? Yeah, and that's right way to do it. if you know sort of what that guiding light is, then I think it can help you get through it, even if it's particularly busy. I mean, so for right now, of course, I am in the throes of my long game book launch, which means I'm, I'm much busier than usual. I've, I've sort of taken on this extra, this extra mm. job of, oh, wow, all this promotional activity. But, you know, last fall or last summer, it was all about, okay, writing the book, which is yes. a different suite of activities. Now I'm not doing that at all. Uh, but it, it's all about the kind of heads up marketing. But you're focusing on blocks of, you know, sort of big priority. You've got a base load of things, but sort of blocks and, 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 and priority areas. Yes. I mean, for me, the one thing I've, in terms of community, one thing I've been more attuned to is frankly being with good people. And that doesn't mean I'm the same. I agree with them all the time, but people have got good spirit, good intent. Um, because as a solo individual, you won your time, you don't have a lot of leverage, or a different type of leverage compared to a big team. Second, in terms of energy, it matters in terms of how you spend your day. Um, so that's one thing that's worked for me. I think the other thing is consciously having things outside work, whether they are real commitments or just things that are important to you, um, can just anchor you, frankly, and give you a sense of you know, purpose, which, which leads me on, actually, in terms of you. Now, you, you've had lots of success and you'll continue to have lots of success, I'm sure. And, and some of it will be visible, of course, you know, successful books, careers and so on, and you know, the careers you've influenced and so on. But how do you, here's a simple one, how do you measure your impact and your, your life? It, it is a, a, an interesting question. Literally this morning, I was reading an article about, um, it, it, was, it was an older article, but it got uh, sent to me today in this kind of news aggregation site that I subscribe to uh, that ran in the Atlantic in 2014. And it is about the U, the so-called U curve of happiness. And uh, you might, you might be right in the thick of this too, David, as a matter <laughs> of fact, but uh, basically it's talking about how uh, there is an emerging body of research that basically says that in terms of people's overall happiness, controlled for different variables about income and you know all sorts mm -hmm. of different situations, it turns out that once you start adulthood, your happiness seems to kind of plummet. <laughs> and that at around 46 or 47, it is at its lowest point. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks Dory. I'm 47, like, about two, uh, three weeks ago. Thank you. I can't even remember my own birthday. Thank you. Carry on. I was enjoying this conversation. You carry on. Yes, yeah, going only ways up, right? Only ways up. <laughs> the only ways up. That's correct. <laughs> so, so yay, your life just gets exponentially better from here. But actually, they, they said, yeah. I mean, it seems a little, a little surprising, of course, because as one gets theoretically older and older into the decades, one's health perhaps declines. But they said, regardless of that, um, starting at about fifty people's happiness seems to really spike up and even, you know, get to be at its happiest recorded levels in their sixties and seventies. Right. And it's, it's interesting. Um, I think, you know, so how do we measure success? How do we measure our, our impact? I think that it is true that people, people in their forties, uh, some, you know, are often asking questions about, mm, you know, so, so what have I accomplished so far? Yeah. What do I want mm -hmm. to accomplish? How, you know, how does this all play out with timelines? Um, in terms so go on. Of so go on. What about you then? <laughs> so for me personally, I think that I, I am probably at a little bit of, a, of an inflection point where I 
have been running hard for quite a while. And uh, especially over the past year, you know, I think about the pandemic Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, everybody had their own pandemic experience Uh, for some people, you know, frankly, they couldn't accomplish anything. And, you know, you sort of give them a pass. There's an asterisk because, okay, you've got whatever, three kids underfoot and, you know, people are sick and there's, there's things they were doing other life things. Uh, for me, I was basically, you know, my, my cross to bear was I was just sort of sitting in an apartment by myself in New York City, hanging out with my cats. Yeah. And I yeah. decided that instead of moping, all I would do is work. Yes. And yeah. that is good in some ways. I figured I could kind of build up a head of steam and, uh, you know, get additional traction. That is positive. Um, on the other hand, if that's literally all you're doing for, 15 months, um, it gets a little tedious and yeah, it's yeah. time for a little bit of a, of a reset. So I think that the, you know, the things that are on my mind right now, I, I certainly want to be helping. I mean, at a broad level, what I want to do is to try to help other people by demystifying the processes behind how, ideas get yeah. shared Brilliant get that. Traction. yeah yeah i can see that yeah um mm. and on a personal level i i think the, the question that i'm asking is um you know it, it always feels a little scary the idea of like mm, you know well what 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 is the consequence of taking your foot off the brake a little bit uh but i'm uh i'm, I'm thinking about this what what is currently in my mind and what i'm planning for actually because you know Again, we all know from research that this is beneficial. It just feels a little scary. Yes. Uh, but I'm thinking about uh, next year, early next year, taking like two months off and having having a sabbatical so I can just sort of, you know, relax and reset and, and come up with proper, new ideas. That's, that's like a proper sabbatical because I'm going to offend some people as I say this, but I, there are some people who say I took a sabbatical and they took two weeks off in the summer. It's like, and it's not the usual US Euro, European thing, but sabbatical is two three months six months one year one year yeah i mean i i know you i know what you mean i mean in terms of you know i went from a you know corporate type role you know team look after and i and i found it difficult at times not having sort of the people around me and having the same sort of buzz but i guess and it's not a case of oh i woke up one day and suddenly i found it doesn't happen like that transitions as you know it take a long, long time but i found i could find and i'm finding stimuli and new experiences elsewhere but you have to give yourself a bit of space to actually relearn, be comfortable. Um, a mutual friend of ours, Ron Carucci, said you sort of get to get comfortable with the messy period, like the messy, messy period in between. Um, and I love the fact that in your book you talk about, I think a seven, was it a seven year frame? You, talk, you talked about your own big ambitions and I'm, we're not going to talk about it here because we're going to give, give people a tease. They're going to have to go and get the book. But you, you, t- you have some big ambitions. Go on, give, don't, don't tell us, but give a flavor. You have, you have some big ambitions, right? You, for yourself. Yeah, yeah. I mean, actually, I, I think, so part of, part of where this comes from, uh, it, I mean, I was, I was doing this prior to discovering it, but I think it's an interesting frame. Um, there was an interview about a decade ago that Jeff Bezos did with Wired Magazine, and he was talking about the reasons he thought that Amazon was successful. And he said that he thought that one of the decisive differences was that Amazon was willing to plan on a seven year time horizon, whereas his competitors were only willing to plan about three years out. And he said that difference, you know, essentially the willingness to endure the fallow period and to endure the losses that accrue as you're exploring things, um, that made the difference because they were able to take on goals that were far more ambitious. And so for me personally, I'll give, I'll give you an example of, uh, of one that was discarded <laughs> So yeah, to, to, find out, to find out about the actual ones, uh, <laughs> you can get the book. But a discarded example was for a long time, I had the idea that I wanted eventually as kind of like a capstone career, you could say, uh, to become a university president. And so, mm. you know, I, I, I feel like it's often hard for many of us to have these kind of mid-range goals, like that's a little tricky. But but I think that what more of us could do is to have the big picture, like the 10-year goals, the 20-year hmm. goals. Because yeah. the truth is 10 years, 20 years out, you don't have to know how you're going to do it. It's, yeah. it's not like, oh, I'm going to do this and this and this and this. A lot can happen in 20 years. But if you have 
sort of an idea as a North Star, you are going to be scanning the horizon. And when something seems relevant or when something seems possible, you're going to notice it and you're going to be able to gravitate toward it. So in my case, I was interested in the idea of potentially becoming a university president. That was always something that it kind of seemed cool to me. I love academia. Um, subsequently, I, um, I, I've sort of soured on it a little bit because I feel like American universities are a little, they're kind of in a bonkers phase right now that I don't appreciate. But, um, but I did, as part of my exploration process, join a university board. And so I'm yes. on a uh, board of trustees. And that's the kind of thing where if you have these long range goals, you can, you can make these small bets. You can take steps toward it. In yes. my case, that's the $10 bet. It's like, you know, I don't have to upend my life and become a university right. president. I can place a small bet and say, hmm, let me learn more about this on the inside. And it gives you great insight into whether that's something you want to pursue more or whether you can actually say, eh, I don't really need to go further with that. I agree. And I think those small bets clearly is the right way to go forward. I also think, and this is my experience of working with clients, is that there's something about by thinking in that way and acting that way, I also think you become more receptive to opportunities, probably unconsciously sometimes. I can think of many examples where people have literally probably would have discarded something before because their mindset is, this is my path, this is the way I know how life, a very deterministic way. So, um, yeah, I can see that working really well. Dory, we could talk for hours, and I'd love to but you've got a busy schedule. You've got some seven year planning to do and some, and some book promotion and various other things. Um, you are a wonderful person, very generous person. Um, somebody I'm, I'm very happy to have got to know. And um, I'm very happy that you spent time with me today. Where should, um, where should everyone, if they haven't found out about you already, which is shocking, um, where should they find out about more about you and, and the book and so forth? Well, thank you so much, David. I, I appreciate it. Uh, the new book, again, is called The Long Game. It's going to be released uh, fall 2021. And if people are interested in getting started today on answering some of these questions, uh, A, they could pre-order it if they'd like, but B, I have a free long game strategic thinking self-assessment that is available. And you can get that today uh, for free at doryclark.com slash the long game. Fantastic. Dory, it was an absolute pleasure. Thank you ever so much. Thank and, you, uh, David. That was another edition of Lancefield on the Line.